Oh, wait. You have a pass. Then you are late. How does that make you feel? You're right. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. This is what we are going to do today. We are going to continue looking at Chaplin's legacy and impact through some of his other films, which in turn is going to tie into some historical events that uh, you mostly probably have a familiarity with uh, before we move into uh, an analysis activity class project, which um, we'll probably get into that a little bit today. Then tomorrow on Wednesday, that block schedule will be primarily you working in a group on this project. So if you do not come to class tomorrow, then I'm going to be forced to give you another assignment like a paper or something like that, okay? Because pretty much all the work will be done in class tomorrow, so I don't think it'd be fair if you just kind of tagged in after all that work was done if you are gone tomorrow, which is fine. I mean, if you're sick or whatever, I, I get that. We just have to have you do something else. Does that make sense? Also remember, if you miss class, then I want you to listen to the podcast, all right? And you have to give me notes on that podcast, you know, get, you know, showing me evidence that you've listened to it and that you've learned something from it. So just clarifying that. Any questions? What historic? Yes. You can just send that to me in an inbox message in Academy Central because I'm not going to create an assignment because that'd be confusing or whatever. I'll just. I just, I just look at who's been absent, and then I look at my inbox to see who actually gave me the notes, and then I can tell who did. So, again, it's not graded, but it's a behavior report thing or whatever. Although, actually, it can indirectly affect your grade if you don't learn the concepts and then not use them in assignment, then I'll, you know, naturally take off points for that or whatever. So, but anyway, um, any, um, okay, any other questions? Very good question. Okay, so what are some things that we've learned so far, just real quick, about Chaplin? And what historical events have we tied into so far? Yes, Tori. Okay, excellent. To the Roaring Twenties? Superb. All right, what else? Yes. Okay, likes rags to riches, that poor versus rich dynamic, okay, which, again, in the Roaring Twenties, even though we had a lot of wealth, Okay, a lot of that wealth was actually based on credit, which of course is going to fall apart. Also, you still have more poor than wealthy in the 1920s. What else? Yes, yeah, story. Do you like the idea of uh, machines like kind of controlling? Okay, does he like the idea, no, or he doesn't, he doesn't like the idea? idea. Yeah, yeah. He likes to use it. He likes to use Okay, yeah. So what, what film was that in? Someone else? The, the Factory. No, that's Modern not the Times. name of the film. There we go. Modern Times. It's up on the screen. Excellent. Okay, so what was that commentary on? And I was joking around a little bit at the beginning with the cell phone technology thing, but actually I think there's there's like a serious parallel going on there. But, um, Gareth, don't hit him. You, you know, you know, I used to be with your cell phone out earlier. <laughs> yeah, but you put it away like a responsible person, and I appreciate that. So what was what was so this was in modern times, right? So his concern was that technology was going to dehumanize people. Okay, so uh, and it's actually very interesting that that comes up because we literally at in service before you guys came back, we had a teachers meeting, and we talked about technology. All right, and. Uh, it was down at Baylor University. A couple of our teachers went down there, and that was one of the central themes 
to the seminars because it was all about technology, the use of technology. And people were concerned about technology because they felt it dehumanized people if used improperly. So, like, for example, if we only had discussions about what was going on in this class through Academy Central and never face-to-face, -face, students would feel dehumanized by that, right? We don't have as close of a relationship. We're not talking face-to-face. -face. So that's just like the tip of the iceberg in terms of, the, I think, the kind of impact. And Chaplin talks about that in the 1930s. What else is going on during this time when Modern Times is released? 1931, I think it was. Yes, the Great Depression. The Great Depression is going on during this time. Right? And so what do we have going on during the Great Depression? A lot of unemployment. A lot of poverty. Okay, and again, if we were to watch modern times, again, you see that dynamic that he comes, comes out with in terms of the poor and trying to persevere beyond that. And, you know, what's also interesting about this is that he developed comedies during the Great Depression in order to help people during the Great Depression to laugh not just in the United States, but worldwide. Good. Um, so we started watching, uh, we watched one clip of Modern Times, and then we started on this one. This clip's not tremendously deep, but I think it shows a little bit of uh, Chaplin's physical acting. Can we turn that light on? Yeah. Kind of his physical skills as an actor. <laughs> What just happened? <laughs> Chaplin can. What did I do? Oh, okay. And this is more of a true silent film, even though he puts sound into it. So, and again, they are both especially poor, really poor, especially her. And he happened to get this job in the department store, so he brings her there. Of course, he's in love with her. Hold on one second. What did you just say? She's a babe. She's a babe. Okay. I've never heard anybody comment like that before on a Charlie Chaplin film. That is going to go down in history because I'm recording this and I will put that up on the web but anyway go ahead watch a, I, he's just smooth I'm sorry <laughs> that move every time I feel like he's going to go over she's no help so anyway it's just, it's just a cute little scene <laughs> So his physical control in terms of his comedic timing and just stuff like that is is pretty impeccable. Now, one of the Chaplin considered Hitler one of the greatest actors he had ever seen. Oh. I'm just gonna let this roll. Um, 
Wendel überfuscht mit der Schutten. Ey, der flitzen Sektalter mit der Schutten. Ey, der flitzen Sektalten. Der strengelischen mit der Hulten Sektalten. Und der blitzen Sektalten. Besick, besack. Der Schutten. Oh, der Schutten. His Excellency has just referred to the Jewish people. Okay, so, so anyway, this, this movie is called The Great Dictator, and it comes out, uh, it, it comes out in like, I think like 1940, so World War II is underway, although the United States is not involved yet in World War II, but, but Hitler has shown kind of his true colors in terms of wanting to expand and what, what have you. And Chaplin was very in tune with that, and this goes back to my statement before of when he creates a movie, oftentimes he is trying to tell a deeper story. Um, and, and this is very overt, obviously, but he's completely making fun of Hitler. Completely making fun of him. And it was like his mission to do that, which is took some courage because the German people were great fans of his. Remember when I talked about the Dance of the Rolls and the premiere in Berlin and whatever? Like, I mean, they loved him. Okay, when this came out, well, at least the Nazis no longer loved him, all right? And he was never, he did not go back into Germany for a very, very long time. But one of the lines from the beginning, machine men with machine minds with machine hearts, obviously talking about the Nazi party and kind of, you know, what they were like in terms of people and uh, unfeeling and just kind of had one goal in mind in terms of world domination and obviously the perspective on, on the Jews. So that was just a, a little snippet. Uh, I want to show you a little bit more from The Great Dictator as well, because again, I think it's humorous. It also kind of shows you a little bit uh, what Chaplin is trying to do in this film and, uh, and so on. So uh, in, this, in this next clip here, uh, it talks a little bit about the casting for the film. This is going slow. He's coming. He's coming quick. Give me a flower. A flower. Remember, at all times, you must be above him before him. Entering or leaving. Of course, now he's into talkies now. Hello, Hickey! One of the great moments in the That's great supposed to be Mussolini from Italy. is the casting of Jack Oakey as Mussolini. I thought the public extremely enthusiastic on your arrival. Sure. They like to see new faces. Jack Oakey comes out on the balcony and struts That's and actually Mussolini. his chin, and by God, there's Mussolini. So it was a masterful job of casting on the part of Chaplin. You cannot treat the bacterium people this way! I'll take the bacterium people and I'll tear them apart like that! Look, listen, please! Look, come on, you're doing it! That's an insult to the police! Look, he's the best spaghetti! It's spaghetti! He is the the prettier we have a war! <laughs> so, uh, so obviously he's not just poking fun at Hitler, he's poking fun at Mussolini, the Axis powers, again, this idea of their expansion, and the way he's portraying them, right, is kind of like these ninnies, okay, that, you know, underneath all this bravado are kind of weak personalities in a way. Wait for it. <laughs> So, so this is a longer version of the earlier speech that you saw. Keep in mind, nothing that Chaplin says is in German. It's all like a made-up dialect that he has created. And you'll notice, even those words are present in what he's saying. He was ignorant of the Again, kind of this veiled humor. Kinko the dictator ruled the nation with an iron fist. Under the new emblem of the double cross, liberty was banished. Free speech was suppressed, and only the voice of Hinkle was heard. Hey, the Strafnitz Hilfensekt! The Wiener Schnitzel mit der Lage werden und das Saukraut! Hey, the Flüten sagt auf die Lärpen! Ein Tomania wie sein Straf! Ein der Blitzen sagt auf Hütz! Hey, ich play no Straf mit der Ach! Malone! Admiral 
Sinclair has just said yesterday Tumania was down, but today she has risen. Democracy stunk. Democracy is fragrant. Liberty stunk. Liberty is odious. Free sprechen stunk. Freedom of speech is objectionable. Tomenia mit der größten Armee in der Welt. Tomenia has the greatest army in the world. Der größte Navy in der Welt. The greatest navy in the world. Mit seiner hat der größte alles und einer to sacrifice. But to remain great, we must sacrifice. Ah, alles. We must tighten our belts. That's supposed to be Goering, who is really overweight and part of the Nazi party. Ah, Herring. Pupchen Herring. Bismarck Herring. The Fui now speaks to Field Marshal Herring, the Minister of War. We say, Ulten sagt der Pilaten. Ah, from the Hafen sit the Elle Hutz. Ein Herring. Garbage. Herr Garbage, Vincent. He is now addressing Herr Garbage, Minister of the Interior. <laughs> Which is supposed to be Goebbels, who's propaganda uh, of, for the Nazi party. Herring shouldn't smelt fine from garbage, and garbage shouldn't smelt fine from Herring. Herring and garbage. His Excellency recalls the struggles of his early days shared by his two loyal comrades. Versöhnt und der Stretz. Ede Flüten sagt der Klüten, Söhne weiner Hütten. Ein der Stütz mit seiner Klüten sagt der Flirten. What's interesting too, he imitates Hitler's. Hitler always would do, he goes super, super quiet. Low and then crescendo into something really big and extreme. And this is what you've seen already. So then he's he's a he's a really good imitator. We can fast forward a little bit through that. So that that gives you a feel for him. Now in the movie, in the movie, there is a character. Sorry, it's lagging. Yes, dictator of the world. We start with the invasion of Austerlitz. After that, we won't have to fight. We can bluff. Here, I'll just nation let it roll. After nation will capitulate. Within two years, the world will be under your thumb. Believe me, I want to be alone. <laughs> so this is one of the more famous scenes from the film. And again, he's kind of poking fun at Hitler's view of the world and what he ultimately wants to do with it. Out Caesar, out Nolus, Emperor of the world. Ha, ha, ha. 
Just probably a little trampoline there. And then he starts crying. <laughs> so the um, it was interesting. This is a quote from Chaplin. He said, "Halfway through making the Great Dictator." I began to receive alarming messages from United Artists. I mean, there were people that were saying, you should not be making this movie. Germany is not a country to be trifled with. I mean, there are Germans who came over from Germany to America that were staying there. You know, if United Artists wants to make money. You know, is this going to be an unpopular film that's going to struggle in doing that? But then he goes on to say, he said, but I was determined to go ahead because Hitler had to be laughed at. He was like, this had to be done. You know, so it's interesting because just because you are one of the most popular people in the world in terms of the movie business, you know, you still have to have a lot of courage, I think, in some ways to deliver a certain kind of movie. Um, in this movie, part of the plot is that there is the great dictator who is obviously played by Chaplin, but then there is another character uh, who looks exactly like the great dictator which, of course, is played by Chaplin. And they accidentally get switched. So all of a sudden, you know, the innocent, just everyday Chaplin is now thought of as the great dictator. So now he has to be a dictator and lead this country, you know, to war or whatever. And so, you know, so there's a lot of uh, comedy involved, um, involved there. So, um, but in this, in this next clip, this is actually... Uh, right at the end of the movie and um, this was a really interesting quote I thought from from uh, Chaplin as he was making this uh, their destinies were poles apart one was to make millions weep while the other was to make the whole world uh, set the whole world laughing dad and this was actually Chaplin's son talking about Charlie Chaplin dad could never think of Hitler without a shudder just think, he would say uneasily, he's the madman, I'm the comic. But it could have been the other way around. And he's talking, you know, and actually, Chaplin and Hitler have very, very similar, uh, in terms of how they were brought up, both were raised very, very poorly, both were born around the same exact time, and that's why H Chaplin says a little bit like, why am I this way and Hitler is that way? It's kind of an interesting perspective on life, it's an interesting perspective on how you're brought up and, and what have you. So... He kind of had that little insight, which I thought was interesting. But you know, ultimately, of course, he uses this movie to speak out against Hitler and what those powers were doing. And this is the end of the movie. And you see that this isn't the actual great dictator. This is the chaplain that was swapped in accidentally. Okay, So he's going to get up and obviously act very, very differently. Are you following me in terms of the plot line? Okay. So it's the end of the movie. You've watched all this. I'm sorry. But I don't want to be an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone. The good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. 
More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people, and so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes, men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man, nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie, they do not fulfill that promise, they never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! So, what do you think of that speech? What were some things in there that caught your attention? What were some qualities of it? What were some things he was saying? Yeah. I thought it was interesting that you mentioned the Bible, and then like right after that you mentioned some of the humanist ideas. Yeah, yeah. It isn't... Yes, absolutely. I think... And again, this goes back to the gold rush, actually. Remember, you know, we talk about, you know, there's a real message in there in terms of how people should treat others ultimately. You know, that the little trembling really embodies those ideas of, of sacrifice and treating each other kindly. You hear those things in this speech here. But yes, I mean, I would, I would say he does, he very much kind of has this humanist philosophy in, in some of the things that he's, he's saying there. Yeah, good. What else? Very nice pickup. What were some other things that were striking about what he was saying? Do you think it was good? Do you think it was yeah, effective? I felt like uh, in the way he described it, he uh, spoke like Hitler. Uh, exactly. Like Did you notice, like, in the beginning, he starts out really low-key, and then he just he crescendos right up? It's, it's almost like, a, it's like he's trying to manipulate what Hitler has done for good. Yeah, very good. Good. What else? I don't feel like he's really acting in that scene. I feel like he is just up there to give a speech. Like, it doesn't get much more blatant in terms of trying to use your medium to convey a message. You know? And again, this goes back to Coley. What was Coley saying in that very first video we watched? What were some of the things he mentioned? I know, obviously, you know, gay... Uh, homosexual, uh, African Americans, that sort of thing, Christians, etc. But what was kind of the main point of that? The movies were used to do what for those people? To make an impact, right? To change perception. Okay, and that's what 
he does here. I think that's what he's trying to do. That's what uh, Chaplin tries to do in a lot of his films. Good. What else? Did you like about it or thought was was good? Yes. Well, like we talked about how he's sort of like against machinery, but like it doesn't really seem like he's more against like the use. Of exactly how it's used. Exactly because he says in there, you know, use technology, science, progress, whatever exactly the line was for the good of of humanity. Excellent. So yeah, so there's a lot of that you know sort of stuff, and you can actually tear that speech apart. I think for for a while, but uh, you know, part of the reason why I included it there at the end again, kind of going back to this: what kind of message is you know Chaplin trying to convey, and what he's doing? What kind of worldview is permeated in his films, in the films that we see? The most inane of films that are created, I think, has a message or worldview, and it's important to recognize that. So. All right, uh, Legacy of Chaplin, I'm going to feel like I'm going to repeat myself here. 1972, he won an Academy Award for his incalculable effect in making motion pictures the art form of the century. People imitate uh, him, uh, everything from storylines to acting, etc. His impact is, it's hard, it's hard to measure it. Um, arguably the biggest comic in film history. As I said, they either clearly reflect a culture or articulate a clear commentary on what was going on at the time. Even in the gold rush, the costuming, right? They, you know, the dancers look like flappers, even though it's supposed to be the 1890s. So all sorts of uh, reflections of culture in that. So with that, I want to transition to our activity. So uh, we've got 11, 12 minutes. So what I want to do is um, show you the assignment so you understand what it is. It is a group assignment. I randomly created groups, okay, unbiasedly. All right, so, um, and I will tell you what groups. How big are the groups? Uh, no bigger than four. Oh, four. Okay, so the assignment is obviously under Unit 2, Charlie Chapman, The Gold Rush. It is called the Gold Rush Scene Analysis. Right there. Do we see it? Thank you. All right. So you click on that, and it takes you to this, uh, this page right here. Okay. So for this assignment, you will work in groups and analyze your assigned scene. I'm going to assign your group a scene to look at. Okay. And again, some of you might be thinking, oh, well, we've talked about the Gold Rush. We've kind of analyzed it as a class. I don't know how well you personally have analyzed it. Plus, I want you to go into more detail and use some of the tools that I have taught you to really break the scene down. All right. So um, please analyze the scene based off of the categories listed in your movie analysis sheet, the Gold Rush, which, by the way, you need to turn that in to me at the end of this project where you're writing down your thoughts. Okay, so don't lose that. If you have, you need to print one out and fill it out again. Um, you also can use, you want to use things I've taught you from the class presentation, the history of te technique and film. You will present your analysis to the class. All right, so on Friday, I'm going to give you all day tomorrow work in it, work on, on the scene. Okay, that should be plenty of time. And then... On Friday, we'll pull up the clip, and then you will simply present to the class your observations. All right, so it's pretty simple in terms of, of that piece. Um, you don't have to create a video or anything of that, that sort of thing uh, at this point. Um, everyone in the group must contribute and say something during the class presentation. Does that make sense? You must speak. All right. uh, in preparation for your presentation, you should type up what you're going to say to the class I want you to submit that to Academy Central. Okay, this is helpful for me. When I go back and grade, I can remember a fair amount of what was said, but it's nice to have your notes as well. It helps me remember precisely everything, hopefully. Make sure to indicate who is saying what in the notes that you prepare. If, you know, sometimes people will put them on one sheet. I just want to know who is saying what, if that's uh, appropriate. You must use complete sentences or... If you want to use informative phrases for this, that is fine, because I'm kind of grading more the presentation, not so much how you're writing it up. 
Okay, but again, if you give me one word answers, statements, etc., you run the risk of being too ambiguous. Does that make sense? I'm, am I being clear? As a bell? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, a little shout out to you. you know, okay. So here are the different scenes. Thanksgiving dinner, all right, when he makes the shoe. Meeting Georgia, when he meets her in the dance hall for the first time. Okay. Inviting Georgia over for dinner. The scene where he freaks out, throws pillows all around because he's excited they're going to come over. The dance of the rolls. Okay, so when they are there, quote unquote, for dinner. And then at the end, kind of as the house falls off, that last part of the scene, and then the concluding scene as well. So those are the scenes we're going to analyze. Your groups are as follows. Inviting Georgia over for dinner. Emily Anderson, Jocelyn Gonzalez, Courtney Talbot, Tori Telshow. Uh, meeting Georgia, Doug, Melody, David, Peter. Thanksgiving dinner, Keely, Jack, Gareth, Olivia. Dance of the Rolls, Gabby, Stephanie, Josiah. We'll be millionaires, Alexandria, Abigail, Kyle. Sorry, Abby, I just was reading the name. Okay. Because he added his name back when that was possible to do. What? Or maybe someone not changed it back. Didn't you? And I don't want to get into that right now. It's okay. It's NBD. Okay, so. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm so hip. I just want to point that out. Okay. If you forget, if you forget what group you are in, if you mouse over courses and groups, it will show you on this side what group you are in. Does that make sense? Okay, so are there any questions on what you need to do for this assignment? Okay, if you go through a presentation and don't mention one technical term, okay, you're not going to get a very good grade. Remember, I want you to use the tools that I gave you. Shots of composition, directing, screenwriting, you know, how to analyze a movie. Reference those things if you forget what they are. That's important to me. All right. And remember, it's not just identifying a close-up shot. So if you just say, yes, there's a close-up shot in this screen. There is a medium shot in this part of the scene. And we thought the screenwriting was pretty good. Okay. You've named techniques, but you need to go a step further and tell me how they affect the perception of the scene. How they delivered. You know, one question you, or, you, know, you, know, you can ask yourself is, how does this deliver dramatic value? Right? Or, what is the point of this shot? Because remember, a director, everything is pretty purposeful, if they're good. You may now get into your groups and start to brainstorm a little bit the scene, think a little bit about it, okay? maybe some things that stick out. All right? um, and then tomorrow, we meet in the library. Don't come here, come to the library. Not here. To the library. To the library you go, not to here. Yes. Yes, no library. No, meaning yes, go to the library, not no library. Go to the library. Okay. I'll, not the Learn Lab, not the Commons. Not Jasper's room. <laughs> All right, we're extending the joke way too long. I will end this recording.